Greetings and welcome to another lecture in introductory psychology. This one involves therapies that themselves involve operant conditioning. Now remember, operant conditioning is where voluntary behavior is controlled, is conditioned according to its outcomes. If the behavior occurs and then something good happens, the individual is more likely to do that behavior. If they do a behavior and something bad happens, they're less likely. It's the law of effect. And so the idea here is to use the law of effect to try to change behavior. Now, this isn't like insight therapy where they're trying to figure out, you know, why they're doing the behavior. Why doesn't matter. The idea here is if your behavior bothers you, we're going to fix it. And therefore, it won't bother you anymore. The heck with how you got it. Let's just fix it. Now, specifically what I'm talking about here, as I said, is operant conditioning. And so when we're talking about operant conditioning, we're usually talking about, first of all, reinforcement. No one has a problem with reinforcing behaviors that you want. That is fine. Everyone is all for that. Reinforce behaviors that you want. Start with a continuous reinforcement schedule. Move to a partial reinforcement schedule and then wean it off. It's amazing how well this works, even on adults, even when they know that this is being done to them. The controversial bit, and it is indeed very controversial, is using punishment. Now remember the idea behind punishment is to make a behavior less likely to occur. The thing is, though, it does have a lot of bad side effects, things like aggression and learned helplessness and passive aggressiveness and that sort of thing. And, of course, the big fact that it doesn't get rid of behavior as much as it suppresses it. But the idea is, can we use punishment judiciously, not punish all over the place, but judicious, judicious punishment in order to stop a behavior that may indeed be harmful in and of itself? Probably the best known example of this, or most infamous might be a word, is using punishment to stop self-injurious behaviors in children with autism. Now autism is a developmental disorder and one of the, side, one of the symptoms of autism very much is repeated behaviors. Repeated behaviors over and over and over again, sometimes for hours on end. Now, sometimes these behaviors are relatively harmless, things like hand flapping or spinning. But sometimes the behaviors are self-injurious. Children will hit themselves, they'll smack themselves, they'll pinch themselves, they'll claw themselves. And when you do that for any length of time, there's definitely going to be damage. So back in the 1960s, some researchers wanted to know whether or not they could use punishment, a fairly mild punishment compared to punching and gouging and pinching. They decided to use mild electrical shocks. No, they were not shocking the bejubies out of these people. We're talking something about the same as the, the, the kind of electrical shock you get in the winter when you walk across a carpet. We used to call that a poke. You walk across the carpet, you reach for the metal doorknob, and you get a little shock. It's not damaging, it's startling, it's not even that painful when you think about it. And so the researchers wanted to know whether or not they could stop behavior by using punishment. When the child started a self-injurious behavior, you would give them that mild electrical shock. Now there was some discussion about whether or not the kids would even feel it. Because compared to the punching and the, and the slapping and the gouging, the shock was nothing. But something very interesting happened. They had a control group of children that were treated in the usual way. The usual way to treat children who are hurting themselves is to simply prevent them from hurting themselves. If a kid punches him or herself, you put big gloves on so they can't hurt themselves. If they claw themselves again, gloves to prevent damage. If they hit their head into the wall, which some kids will do for hours, you get a football helmet. And so, and then you reward behaviors when they're not hurting themselves in the hope that these rewarded behaviors will then become the majority of the behavior. So th these researchers compared children treated in the usual way with prevention plus reinforcement versus children treated with a very mild punishment. And they found something very interesting. In this slide, John was treated with punishment. He would receive a very mild electrical shock after he would have hurt himself. And notice what happened to the rate of self-injurious behavior, self-destruction actions as they call it here. By 11 sessions after they started, he had stopped. Going from a huge number of self-destructive actions down to nothing. 
Greg, on the other hand, who was treated with the usual restrain and reinforce, eventually also got to zero, but it took him a lot longer, even though he started at a lower level of self-destructive behavior. Apparently, there's a difference. And if you think about it, it makes sense. There's a difference between hurtful things you do to yourself and hurtful things that come from outside of you. The hurtful things you do to yourself, you might be able to handle a little better than things that, that you don't do to yourself. Maybe a little bit of that perception of control that I talked about from the stress chapter. It could also might be related to the whole you can't really tickle yourself kind of thing. You know, if you've ever tried tickling yourself, it doesn't work. We have that tickle reaction, by the way, probably as a response to back in the day when most of us were carrying around fleas and lice and other sort of vermin infesting our skin. And a tickle probably meant you had a bug there and you wanted to get it out. <laughs> but if you tickle yourself, you get nothing. You don't get the reaction. You get nothing like that. Maybe this pain is the same way, that the pain these children get themselves is different from the pain that is given to them. Whatever it is, John improved dramatically and improved fast, while Greg took a lot longer. So why is it that this sort of therapy is not used regularly, regularly to treat children with autism? And the reason for that is simple. You're shocking children. I mean, just the thought of that tends to make people cringe in horror, even after it's explained that we're doing it to keep them from damaging themselves even worse. And also, one could argue with some validity, how do you make sure that this doesn't get out of control? Who's going to be in charge of the shocking? Is it going to be a doctor or a nurse or a technician? Who's going to decide how often to shock, how many shocks, what behaviors to get shocked, how strong the shock is going to be? How often do you do this? Do parents decide? Do doctors decide? What happens if someone loses their temper? You can always tell when something is controversial, or at least you could, back when it would show up on the original Law & Order TV series. And the shocking autistic children being abused and resulting in death, which as far as I know has never actually happened, showed up on Law and Order roughly 1995. Um, and indeed, I believe that there is only one place in Connecticut that still uses this kind of punishment to stop self-injurious behavior, and they have gotten tons of bad press. Whether or not it's actually deserved, it's hard to say. Because whenever you're talking punishment, it's such a fine line between what is allowed and what is... I mean, think about it. Perfectly normal kids, parents get freaked out if they get punished, not even physically punished, but if they get punished in school. It's just... I mean, the, the big word here is going to be, whenever we're going to talk about punishment, is going to be controversial, and it is. What it might be done with... I mean, is. It would make sense to use this, I think, in children who are hurting themselves so badly that they are in danger of permanent physical damage. But you're going to have to look at it as the end justifying the means. We can't be shocking people just because they're doing something that's not too bad. Maybe this could be uh, used for just the most extreme cases. But then again, who gets to decide that? This is one of the many things in psychology that aren't really you can't really scientifically pin down a correct answer a lot has to do with philosophy a lot has to do with the person's point of view and what make might make perfect sense to one person may not make sense at all to another which is another reason why using punishment is controversial like i said reinforcement great reinforce behaviors all you want everybody's happy that's wonderful punishment not so much